Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Dance VR. Dance VR is like Dance Dance Revolution, or just dance, but with VR. No, uh, that's it. it. That's the ad. What more could you want? It's dancing in your living room with a VR headset. You're listening to music, you're watching a virtual dance instructor, you're dancing to the music, and you're trying to match it. Is it more fun than with the VR? Uh, maybe. I, I don't know. Sometimes it's a little disorienting, uh, but now that VR is here, we have to port all of our games to VR. So, Dance VR, it's like all of the other dancing games, but with VR. Dance VR. When you watch someone dancing, what's happening? Are you focused on the movements, the rhythms, the music, or how the movements complement the sounds you hear? Do you feel something from the dance? Well, it could be all of these, and maybe even more. Uh, today I speak with Jarno Janavi about dance perception. And so, <laughs> somebody I've known all year, Jarno Janavi, I, I have to say it very quickly, uh, <laughs> so that I hopefully get it correct. Uh, but we're talking about dance perception, and uh, I'd like to know why people are uh, choosing the topics that they want to talk about in terms of uh, the brain's contribution to uh, dance, or whatever their topic may be. Uh, so, uh, what got you interested in dance? Um, so, I have been doing Indian classical dance for 15 years, um, and I've been doing another type of dance form called Eurythmy for 12 years. And both of these dances, they have a unique sort of spatial awareness, as well as a, um, a Eurythmy specifically is called a dance, but it's specifically a dance form because it's dance drama. Um, so I was interested to see how spatial awareness impacted neuroscience. Um, of course, the first thing I ran into, there's no research. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It's difficult to do a brain MRI on a dancer while they're moving. Mm -hmm. um, so I chose to do the neuroscience of dance perception, which is actually equally interesting because um, when you watch a dancer and you know the moves, there's different uh, parts of your brain that are activated, more parts are active versus someone who doesn't know the moves. Uh, an expert versus a non-expert. Yeah, so what sorts of things separate someone who is a dancer or an expert within a dance from a non-expert? Well, the biggest thing is that their action observation network is activated, um, and this almost, the sort of the way I think of it is that it's almost like, oh, I know that, I'm familiar with that, and more parts of my brain are active with it. It's less than just watching it, it's mm -hmm. more of almost doing it, but not quite, not with your body doing it in your brain. So it's kind of like me watching you dance, like reverberates my own dance exactly. abilities in my brain exactly uh, and versus somebody who's a novice or doesn't have the, that experience yeah. they're just kind of watching something mm -hmm. Definitely. that they don't understand as well uh, so do you think that there's a relationship between the expertise in the dance? Uh, yes, and... um, yes, there is. So if you are familiar with the dance form, there's a certain level of activation. If you know the exact moves, there's an even greater level of activation, and it seems that there's a greater level of enjoyment, too. Um, there was a study done with three separate groups. One learned the, the dance over the course of the week, one just listened to the dance, and one just watched the dance without music. And at the end of the week, the people who learned the dance, when they watched the dance being performed, they had the most most activation and the most enjoyment um, and maybe that's why we like to watch things we like to go to things that we know but then if you think of the ballet most people can't do ballet right <laughs> but they go to watch the ballet and they find it beautiful and it's interesting because if you aren't familiar with it what gets activated and what you find aesthetically pleasing is what is physically challenging and um, beautiful and something that you can't even imagine yourself doing but you find it more pleasing you, you think there's something about like the su surprise uh, element. Um. I think I think so. I think that that's part of it. Um, I also think that when you know a dance form and you watch it being performed, you're more critical of it. Yeah. So even if there's like a small misstep, you are aware of that and it, it, it jars you a little bit more versus if you don't know the dance form. It's just beautiful. Right. Yeah, it reminds me of watching uh, the Olympic skating and mm. they'll do some move and I'm like, wow. And then the uh, judge is like, well, they're going to lose some points. On that <laughs> yeah, one. exactly. And it's like, oh, okay. Exactly. Look good to me. Uh, and so uh, also uh, thinking of, of dance 
perception. Uh, you mentioned uh, emotion. Is there also some uh, aspect of memory mm -hmm. uh, playing a role in uh, your ability to recognize these moves? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's a little bit difficult to figure out what type of memory because yeah. um, when a dancer is on stage and they're performing a movement they've performed for a long time, I would imagine it's more muscle memory, and but there is a spatial awareness and memory of the room location possibly. Um, but when you're watching a dance being performed, um, I have I haven't actually come across a research which talked about whether what happens if you've seen that dance over and over again. Mm -hmm. But I'd imagine it's definitely it definitely plays a role. Yeah. So um, expertise is uh, in terms of these like kind of physical actions is a kind of side of interest of mine. Nothing I've done research on um, formally. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, I'm thinking of like, uh, how do we teach dance, mm -hmm. and what might be the best way to teach dance? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is you mentioned the watching versus listening versus learning. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, learning was the best. Uh, but how can we, like, kind of accelerate the learning process right. with dance? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I think that from personal experience, this isn't from a study. Mm -hmm. um, a sort of four or five prong approach is best. So yeah. definitely practice makes, it will just make perfect, sure, but it gets right. as perfect yeah. as you can. But also watching yourself dance, watching yourself in a mirror, just listening to the music while you walk around. That's something I would often do before dance performances. And in the car on the way to the performance, I would just listen to the song and go over the movements. Because once your body knows the movements, it knows the movements. And at the, that point, it's just your brain, it's your mind that needs to get over the huge audience and the blaring yeah, lights. Right. Um, so. Yeah, I think that incorporating different approaches is important. Yeah, because it seems like across, I, I've very, I took one dance class in, <laughs> in college, uh, so <laughs> that coming from a fairly novice, but it seems like a, what I know about dance across uh, all of the different kind of areas of dance, everyone kind of learns the same way. If you have a yeah. teacher at the front, there's mirrors, and right. you kind of practice um, moves in small pieces, and then kind and of chunk those together. pieces together. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering if there's a way that we could understand how our brain is working with uh, watching dance or perceiving dance and we might kind of maybe mm -hmm. think about teaching dance in yeah. a different way. Yeah, um, I think it would, I mean, it would involve perceiving it as well. So when you're dancing, of course, as a dancer, when my teacher is dancing in front of me, I always do the reverse. I don't do the mirror. Um, so when I end up going to a class where it's a novice class and the teacher is doing the mirror, I always get lost because I'm... I'm, I'm doing what I was taught. Right. Um, so I think that it depends on uh, what style of dance it is too, because mm -hmm. something with classical Indian dance is that um, we use bells on our ankles and okay. that helps you stay in rhythm. Um, so I think that, and that might connect to the neuroscience of how you listen and how mm -hmm. the music affects you. So I think that it depends because for some students it's um, more being in tune with the music that's important and that's a struggle. For some students it's coordinating their body. Okay. Um, so I think it depends on what portion they're struggling with and then perhaps a different way, perhaps if it's music, maybe they could play the violin. Maybe that would help them in dance. Um, and that could be a way of sort of training mm -hmm. their brain in a way. Yeah. But yeah. So kind of breaking it into the action versus the perception exactly. of the music or the rhythm uh, and uh, trying to teach people about that. Exactly. Uh, and so looking uh, forward to some other topics, uh, are, do you think that there's any aspects of dance or dance perception that seem confusing to you or maybe to the general public? Um, I think it's a bit confusing um, exactly what's going on because they talk about, well, it is more activation in the brain, but it seems a little bit different for different people. Um, so I think that it's still, again, it's, it's, there still needs to be more research, of course. Um, and I'm hoping that at some point, perhaps there'll be research done on when you're looking at a dance form in order to learn it, how you your brain is active in that sense. Like, do you, if you're watching it over and over again, do you uh, watch certain portions and break it up and then go back over? Do you keep replaying it in your mind? Is that portion of your mind active even when that movement isn't happening? So I think that would be really interesting um, because I think that it's difficult, of course, to just learn a dance from looking, but that's basically what we end up doing because we imitate. Right. It's a more direct connection, but it's, it's essentially what we're doing. Yeah, uh, so I, you kind of raised a question in, in my mind uh, in terms of like the imagination or the ability to kind of simulate these dance moves. Mm -hmm. So if I'm watching dance and my brain is, uh, as a dance expert, my brain is automatically kind of reverberating and replaying those similar movements in my own kind of movement mm -hmm. uh, or action system. Uh, I wonder how well uh, someone kind of doing visualization or like kinesthetic imagination of the uh, dance form 
might be able to help. Right, yeah, and I think that's where um, it connects back to if you're a novice but you're watching a really challenging dance, you still find it aesthetically pleasing because theoretically you could do that move, but it's not realistically possible necessarily. Because um, I, I get like watching the ice skating and all that, you think it's beautiful. Um, but I think for an expert, it depends on their expertise again. It depends on how they're interacting with it. So they're, if, they, if it's a move that they've mastered and they're able to do, yeah, definitely. I think that they would um, very much relate to it. And then I think it would also be interesting to look at an expert dancer who is now aged and how they relate to the movement because at one point they could right. do it. Can they still do it? Do they relate to it in the same way? Is the same portion of their brain active? Yeah. That would be interesting. Yeah, and so since we were just talking about kind of a public or general understanding, uh, has there been any response from friends or family or fellow dancers on your BuzzFeed? Yeah, um, I think that the biggest thing, there was one uh, question which I asked was, which was, um, do people enjoy dance with music or without music more? And I and the answer was, it's complicated. Okay. Um, and a fellow dancer was telling me, uh, it's not complicated. <laughs> I was like, um, I agree with you. I think that with music, it's it's more beautiful. But there's different portions of it. Without the music, it's more of a physical uh, kinesthetic mm -hmm. um, pleasure that people get from watching when it's with music again there can be problems with if it's slightly offbeat so there's so it's an interesting um, dynamic and I, I would have never thought that dance could be performed without music but um, whenever there's a lot of Indian classical dance troops that are all deaf troops oh, and yeah. they perform and it's beautiful and they're very much in beat but then they're almost feeling the rhythm in their bodies instead of hearing it so there is again different ways of experiencing the music or feeling the music um, but yeah, so I think that the general response has been that it's an, it's a really interesting uh, BuzzFeed quiz, but it's of course difficult. Most, yeah. most people did not get 100% on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it, definitely people were very interested to learn more, and I had some really good conversations with one of my friends um, who's at a, a school in Ohio, and she was telling me, she was asking me if a few more details. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, that's really fascinating. As you were talking about. Um, music and uh, dance and, and how they match up and, and don't. I was thinking of my one music class I took. I, I was on some, uh, we did some modern dance, and mm -hmm. the, I can't remember his name, but a modern dance composer uh, who uh, would do all these interesting things like uh, give people uh, the moves uh, through like a randomizer, like roll mm -hmm. a dice, and like each uh, number corresponded to a different move, and so like just before the show, the dancers would roll these dice, and like that was the moves that they had oh, to wow. do, like on the moment. And they have never heard the music before. And uh, sometimes uh, I remember one dance; they had like a iPod uh, shown to the audience, and mm -hmm. like the audience uh, had like their own iPods and like listened to their own music. Oh, uh, while wow. watching um, the dance Wow, themselves. that's really interesting. Yeah, I'll have to see if I can remember um, really who that was. I wrote a <laughs> essay on him, so uh, <laughs> it shows you uh, what happens to your college essays <laughs> down the road. Um, so if you don't remember you know, Dance Perception, you'll probably remember Dance Perception <laughs> since it's interesting, but if, once you write something outside of your area of interest, uh, it disappears. Yeah. Uh, so how about going forward? Do you think that uh, there's some new or developing area that uh, should be pursued in dance perception? Yeah, um, I think that there was one research, talking about learning, there was one research studying how people can learn through just visual, uh, to, through just watching, and I think that perhaps that might help them in other parts of their um schooling, academic, uh, educational career, so if a student is able to, I mean, I think it has got to do with imitation, so perhaps younger kids are better at this, um, and maybe that's something that it's easier to help cultivate. Um, I think that definitely the applications of this are what I would be interested in, as you brought up. Um, what does it mean that more parts of the brain are active? What does it mean that this is more interesting, or expert dancers find this more interesting? Yeah, and I think it can apply to, you know, any movement thing because it seems mm -hmm. like in across most sports or, or yeah. like uh, dances and athletic things it's like you imitate what you see exactly. so you watch your coach hit a baseball or shoot a free throw or exactly. uh, com uh, complete a, a dance move so how can we make that better or yeah. fit it into the uh, things that the brain is doing yeah. uh, while we're doing this uh, all right so I think as we start to wrap up here um, yeah, how about uh, anything that you'd like to promote? Anything I'd like to promote? Um, 
Eighth Dimension. Yes. <laughs> um, Eighth Dimension is a community service organization on Haverford's campus. I'm an intern for it currently. I will be mm-hmm. a staff member soon. Um, and we're having service days in April. Um, and this coming weekend, there's two happening. One at Habitat for Humanity, mm-hmm. and one in the afternoon is at Colors, which is which is an organization that promotes um, knowledge about uh, different gender identities. Okay. And Eighth Dimension, you said it has. Um opportunities every Saturday afternoon? Uh, not every Saturday oh. afternoon, but most Saturday afternoons, okay. yeah. <laughs> All right, and so uh, you have one maybe for uh, not this uh, closest weekend, but uh, another future weekend? Uh, another future weekend. I believe April 24th. Okay. That's a weekend. Yep, it is. That. That's yeah. a Sunday. That's uh, a Sunday. Okay, uh, it's the 23rd. 23rd, 23rd yeah. Yeah. Do you know uh, what sort of things might be planned for the twenty third? I don't. I don't actually know which ones are planned there. I think we're still trying to figure out okay. the, the schedule for that day. Yeah. Uh, well, that sounds like a, a great opportunity and something very important on uh, Haverford's yeah. campus and in the Bico. Yes. Uh, and then the last one, uh, any uh, fatter or product that you think other people should know about? <laughs> any fatter product. So this is or raw milk. I'm yeah. Talking about raw milk. Uh, I drink raw milk. Um, Pennsylvania is one of the few states that allows you to sell raw milk, and we buy raw milk from the farm across our street and drink it. I see the cows every day when I wake up, um, and it's great. It's wonderful. If you get sick, not my fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, take it with a, a grain of salt. Yes. I did see uh, some uh, recent research uh, looking at the benefits of um, whole milk, mm-hmm. and oh. it's, uh, what a, now I'm going to mess it up. I think it was a, related to a decrease in um, cardiovascular issues. Mm-hmm. So, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, well, thank you so much for coming in and talking about uh, dance you. and the brain. Thank you. So thanks so much to Jarno for coming in and speaking about dance and how we perceive dance and what's going on in our brain while we're doing so, uh, in particular the differences uh, across expertise in uh, dance and dance perception. Uh, and uh, as I kept asking questions uh, about dance and how we learn dance, uh, I think it has many applications uh, outside of dance, uh, as I was saying, that uh, how do we learn best, uh, and, and is it just through watching someone else do something? Uh, I think Jarna mentioned that uh, humans have this kind of innate ability to imitate, but uh, how are we, uh, let me think about that as my thoughts get jumbled, uh, it seems like uh, just imitating someone is not necessarily the best way to uh, try to learn something, in particular if we see these uh, differences in brain activation across uh, expertise. Uh, it seems that imitating someone when you have the uh, potential or the abilities to do something may be helpful, but uh, for those beginners uh, who uh, brain activity or brain activation looks different uh, while they're watching someone uh, perform something, maybe there's something we could do better for them uh, that's uh, not just imitating. Uh, so quite a interesting and uh, potentially uh, kind of far-reaching uh, effects in this research area. Uh, turning to the uh, last a uh, couple segments of, of the show. Uh, I'm first uh, going with uh, Jake's Jams, uh, things that I'm interested in or uh, things that I'm trying to recommend to other people. Uh, the uh, ad uh, that's supporting this uh, program or this uh, show today was Dance VR, uh, a potential uh, virtual reality version of uh, Dance Dance Revolution or just dance. Uh, it was uh, based on uh, the fact that Oculus Rift is now shipping uh, the VR experience uh, that... Uh, allows you to uh, kind of experience uh, virtual reality uh, at your uh, at home or uh, uh, at work. I've seen videos of people using it on uh, public transportation, uh, but uh, I think we'll see uh, VR become more ubiquitous uh, as uh, more people uh, start to use uh, Oculus Rift, uh, the new uh, VR experience that's becoming more popular. Uh, so I, I definitely suggest people try out Oculus Rift and, and see what the, all the hype is about VR. I haven't uh, tried it myself, but it looks quite interesting. Uh, and then turning to the last segment of the show, uh, the Twitter tweets or reader mail, still nothing, uh, probably because uh, these are being released so quickly, uh, back to back to back. In the future, I'll probably be looking at a bi-weekly show uh, once every uh, two weeks uh, to... Uh, kind of slow down and, and be able to think more about uh, the shows. I won't have a steady stream of uh, people to interview, uh, and I'll have to start thinking about uh, my topics uh, more thoughtfully uh, rather than uh, asking others to come up with the topics and then uh, ask them about them. Uh, 
Uh, so when, uh, once the uh, kind of flow of these podcasts slow down, uh, I'll hope that there will be more uh, reader mail or, or tweet or tweets. Uh, so you can tweet me at EngageBrain on Twitter, or you can email me at EngageBrainPodcast at gmail.com with any questions or suggestions. Uh, so that's it for now. Uh, this has been the Engage Brain Podcast. Thanks so much for listening.